The Tom Woods Show, episode 1417. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you've ever considered publishing a book through Kindle, I have a lot of experience with it. I helped to publish Bob Murphy's book in Kindle, my own book, Real Descent, that was self-published, I published in Kindle, and I've assembled some videos that will show you step-by-step all the tech aspects of preparing your manuscript to be published as a Kindle book, and also a series of strategies that most people don't know about that Kindle itself makes available to you to help get the word out about your book so people actually see it and buy it. Get these videos for free at tomwoods.com slash Kindle. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. Today, I'm sharing with you something that you almost certainly would otherwise not have heard, and that is a panel discussion I participated in at this year's state convention of the Libertarian Party of Florida. And as with some other material that I've played for you from there, I, I do want to point out there was an audio issue that they didn't catch, so the audio isn't as crisp as I like to have on the Tom Wood Show, but you'll be able to understand everything we're saying. Participants on the panel are Jeff Deist, president of the Mises Institute, Walter Block, the most prolific living libertarian. I think it's safe to say when he's got just about, I think, 600 scholarly articles published, which is just an amazing figure, not to mention all those books. He's a professor at Loyola University in New Orleans. And then, of course, I'm the final panelist. And the moderator is Joshua Smith, who is an at-large representative of the Libertarian National Committee. And we talk about a bunch of interesting topics, and I just think you're going to enjoy it. So, here we go. What's going on, Libertarians of Florida? How are you guys? For those of you in the room that don't know who I am, my name is Joshua Smith. This is my second Libertarian Party of Florida State Convention. I am always honored to be here, and I appreciate you guys very much. I am also very honored to be on the stage with three amazing gentlemen who have been pivotal in my growth with the libertarian movement. I was brought to the ideology by Mr. Murray Rothbard. If you don't know, he had a hand in founding the Mises Institute. So also for those of you who don't know, the Mises Institute is located in Auburn, Alabama. It's named after the Austrian school uh, economist Ludwig von Mises because it promotes teaching and research in the Austrian School of Economics and views on social and political philosophy. So with no further ado, let's get into introductions. First, we will introduce Walter Block. Uh, Dr. Walter Block is an American Austrian School economist, economist and anarcho-capitalist theorist. He currently holds the Harold E. Worth Eminent Scholar Endowed Chair in Economics at the J.A. Butt School of Business at Loyola University, New Orleans, and is a senior fellow of the Ludwig von Mises Institute in Auburn, Alabama. Everybody give a hand to Mr. Walter Block. Second, I'd like to introduce Dr. Tom Woods. Tom Woods is an American historian, uh, political commentator, author, podcaster. Uh, Woods is a New York Times best-selling author and has published 12 books. He also hosts two very successful podcasts, which you should definitely follow and give money to, The Tom Woods Show and Contra Krugman. Everyone give a, hand, a round of applause for Dr. Tom Woods. <laughs> Wow, you, you have a podcast? <laughs> I, also, I also give away free ebooks, but I keep that a real secret. Oh, and uh, since we're in Florida, he's definitely not a member of the League of the South. <laughs> Just in case anybody's wondering. By the way, I am part of the Os- I live in Osceola County. Is there anybody else from Osceola County here? Am I the representative of Osceola County in the room? Okay. All right. You're now the chair of Osceola County. If, if, if Good job speaking up. If it weren't for me, you know, there'd be no representation. All right. And finally, Mr. Jeff Dice, who we've already been introduced to, is the president of the Ludwig von Mises Institute. An all-around awesome guy, but um, for those of you that don't know, I was also brought to the Libertarian Party through Wave Ron Paul, so I've known who Jeff is for a while, and you guys all should too if you don't follow him, listen to his podcasts or whatever. So we'll get into questions. Let's start with who is Ludwig von Mises to you, and uh, we'll start with Tom. Oh, wow. Well, this kind of reminds me of, uh, I was walking down uh, Times Square the other day, And there's a a limited run play running, and it's called What the Constitution Means to Me. 
And the words to me at the end just make me crazy. Like the Constitution doesn't really have a meaning apart from how you feel about it. And that just so enraged me that I stopped in my tracks. I took a photo of this. I tweeted it out. And I said, something tells me the text of the Constitution has nothing to do with the answer that we're going to get in this play. So I did not check that one out. Um, I was with my daughters anyway, so we went to see Frozen instead. Anyway, but what Mises represents, let's say, for me, is two things. At first, well, three things. Number one, um, a, a, a gentleman. I mean, he's the, he's the embodiment of what a gentleman is in every aspect of his life. Second, of course, a scholar, and a scholar who fought against seemingly insuperable odds. I mean, the, the fact that he has to flee Europe because of, let's say, unfavorable political conditions for a Jewish man. He winds up coming to the United States almost empty-handed. He's, he does speak some English, but not to the point where at the beginning he felt comfortable writing. He had trouble writing in English, and Henry Hazlitt would help him with his prose and all this. So it, it was tremendously difficult. And his view, his laissez-faire view, was not popular in academia. And so he winds up getting an unpaid position at NYU, and his salary is paid by the William Volcker Fund. And yet he just carries on and carries on. He doesn't whine. He doesn't complain. There's no woe is me. He just carries on and carries on. That's an example to us. And the stuff he produces is out of this world amazing. So I, I guess th those actually were three things, the gentleman thing, the scholar thing, but also the determination, the fact that the easiest thing in the world for a man of his intellect would have been to just try and smooth over some of the rough edges of what he's saying and you know, well, of course, I'm not saying we have to abolish all those things. Maybe we can cut them 15 percent. If he had been willing to say things like that, he would have been teaching at prestigious universities. But at the same time, he wouldn't have been able to live with himself. And by staying true to these ideas, he's created an amazing legacy to the fact, you know, we still talk about him today. Who else? Name somebody else on the NYU faculty in 1965. <laughs> There's my point. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tom. How about you, Walter? Who is, who is Mises to you? Well, I don't like to brag, but I think I'm the only one in the room that ever shook Mises' hand. All right, we'll give you that one. <laughs> and I, I never washed my hand after that. So the hand is a little dirty, but if you shake my hand, you channel Mises. So uh, the occasion was Murray, I was part of Murray Rothbard's living room, and Murray... Um, uh, I forget exactly who was there, Leonard Liggio, Ron, uh, Ron Hamaway, uh, Ralph Raco, Walter Grinder. About five or six of us, Murray dragged down to the last uh, seminar that Mises did in, uh, at NYU. And Mises was not as, uh, he was very elderly then, and he wasn't able to hear that well, and he wasn't able to speak that well. Percy Graves was sort of his translator. He would uh, yell at Mises' and hear what the question was, and he would yell what Mises' answer was. But even through that, you could sort of see, uh, you know, th this guy is sort of like Mozart and Bach. I mean, I'm, I'm into Baroque music. And um, Mises is Mozart and Bach, as far as I'm concerned, the be all and the end all. Uh, I think he's the greatest economist who ever lived. Murray Rothbard is the second. Uh, I think Murray Rothbard is the greatest libertarian who ever lived, but uh, Mises was the greatest economist who ever lived. Uh, Mises made uh, signal contributions to all sorts of realms and reaches of economics. Uh, he did magnificent work on um, a business cycle, for example, uh, political philosophy. Uh, Hayek, who won the Nobel Prize, was his student, never a formal student. I was never Barry Rothbard's formal student, but I was his student. Hayek was Mises' student. Mises is just uh, uh, a magnificent economist and, and uh, a very gracious man, very hardworking man. I mean, look at, look at all the books that he did. Uh, my own introduction of Austro-Libertarianism was, was first through Atlas Shrugged and then Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. But soon after that, the two people who I was reading most of all who really educated me were Rothbard and Mises. So I can't say enough about Mises. Um, at Loyola University, we have what is called a human action seminar. Why do we call it the Human Action Seminar? It meets um, twice a month on Friday afternoons. Because Human Action was the first book that we ever did. And we went through all of Human Action. 
Uh, they have the Rothbard Graduate Center or Rothbard Graduate Studies Week at the um, seminar. seminar. Great for him. And uh, they go through, uh, in one week, they'll go through Men Action or Man Economy in State or something like that. That's very intensive. It took us about two years to get through Him in Action. Wow. And every page is just, um, you know, Murray Rothbard used to underline every line in many of his books. That's what me and my fellow seminarians in, in my seminar, not seminarian, <laughs> seminar participants did with that book. I mean, every, every line, every jot, every tittle of it was was just magnificent, and the book is that thick. I don't know, six, seven, eight hundred pages. So uh, if you haven't read Mises yet, I am envious of you, because I will never again read Mises for the first time. You people who haven't read them yet are in store for gigantry. Thank you so much, Dr. Ball. Uh, Jeff Deist, as the president of the Ludwig von Mises Institute, who is Mises to you? You know, I would just say to people, if you haven't read him, you can read him a la carte. I mean, he wrote so much about so many things that you don't have to tear into human action. You can pick up a relatively slim volume like liberalism. You can just read socialism, which he wrote in the 20s, which is a point by point reputation. that will make you a much better debater or speaker with any, you know, when, when someone throws out, you know, well, what about this or that? So he's really someone who's more accessible than you think he is. Human action is a tough read. If, if you haven't read it, I'm going to say, uh, don't start with part one. Um, to read part one last. But, you know, that, that's the thing about, about Mises or other luminaries from the past. I think, I think the fair way to approach it is to say that these are authoritative figures, not just positive. I think that's where we get into trouble sometimes is in viewing any, any speak, any thinker, living or dead, as dispositive on all issues. Of course, no one can, can ever be that, and no one should be that. We should always read things uh, questioningly with our own eyes. And I think that uh, we should treat, I, I think there's a danger in trying to talk about what dead thinkers would say about X, Y, and Z today, because they all lived in very different times. Mises Ford and the former Habsburg Empire, really a man of old Europe, meaning pre-World War I Europe, who's thrust into very, very different times, like tumultuous times for him. And imagine back then being, you know, 50 years old, having moved to America and learn a holy language, not just, you know, see, spot, run, but, but to, to translate dense economics concepts into a new language. It's very, very daunting. So he, he didn't have an easy life, but, but I think what we should take away from these is, is that he's an authoritative figure, someone worthy of reading, and uh, someone we should, we, we should respect, uh, someone we should emulate. But I, I don't, I, you know, I always caution against the sort of uh, homilies that people do, because I think we're all uh, I, I think we should we should use our own minds independently, read Mises, and allow that to inform what you already know or think. Thanks so much, Jeff. So for the next few questions, I'll ask you guys individual questions. Uh, Sir Tom, who are some of your favorite alternative Austrian economists, and can you follow up with any up-and-coming Austrian school economists that you personally like? Okay, yeah, that's a good one. Um, just as long as we're on the topic of what you should read by Mises, the Mises Institute has a book edited by Sean Rittenauer called The Mises Reader. You can download it for free, as with most of the material of the Mises Institute. So if you go to Mises.org and type in Mises Reader, you'll find it, download it for free. And that's going to give you selections from across Mises' career on a variety of topics. And they're all very accessible selections. So it's a very good layman's introduction to Mises. Now, with regard to when we say alternative do you mean people other than the three or four names we all hear repeated? Exactly, like yeah. other it's than Walter? <laughs> Walter, yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, well, let's see. I mean, I would say in terms of, let's say, people that the audience might be less likely to have heard of. Is that where you're going at? Okay. Well, one I like, and I, I interview him a lot, and is Jeff Herbener. And what's great about Jeff Herbener, he's at Grove City College which along with Hillsdale College, they're the two institutions in America that take no forms of federal aid of any kind, including student loans, any of those programs, nothing. They do it all themselves. And that way they can't be dictated to on anything. And that's where Hans Senholtz taught, who of course was at fee for a long time. But anyway, the great thing about Jeff Herbener, he's a, he doesn't write about libertarian polemics he doesn't do any of the stuff I do. He's strictly a scientific economist. But man, is that guy sharp. And what I love about him is, first of all, I've never stumped him. 
But secondly, he went through his career a completely mainstream economist, went through a mainstream PhD program, did a mainstream PhD dissertation. And then in the middle of his career, where he stands to gain nothing by suddenly switching horses and saying, I think the Austrian school is correct and this mainstream stuff I've been taught is all wrong. He did that mid-career. He just abandoned it. And he just started reading Mises and then he read Man, Economy and State. And he said, this is correct. Now, prestige-wise, you stand to gain nothing by making that change. He did that entirely out of his devotion to the truth. And that's why he's one of my favorites, because you just that doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Peter Klein at Baylor University. I mean, this is a guy with a PhD from Berkeley, published all over the place, mainstream stuff, big-time publishers, a big, big, uh, I mean, serious, serious scholar, very, very likable. You know, when he's on my show, you get the idea that yeah, if only Woods could be as likable as this guy. Think of how far ahead he'd get in the world. OK, so I, I like him very much. But then in terms of up and comers, it's an it's an embarrassment of riches. I'm happy to say that there's a big gap, like in terms of people in my generation, where Bob Murphy and I are roughly the same generation. There aren't a whole lot of us in this age range. But in terms of people in their 20s, we've got a whole bunch of them who are great. Or early 30s. So in Spain, we have David Howden. David Howden is so unbelievably brilliant. Why I haven't had him back on my show, I don't know. I'm going to get him back on. Here's a guy who he wanted to study with uh, Jesus Huerta de Soto over, at, um, over in Spain at King Juan Carlos University. But although he spe- you know, uh, Huerta de Soto speaks some English, not a lot. So David, David Howden learned Spanish so he could go get his PhD with this guy, okay? Not a lot of people be willing to do that. And now he still lives in Spain, teaches in Spain, married a Spanish woman. Um, I don't think he's ever coming back, you know? <laughs> so Spain sucked him in. So, so he would be an example. Um, Philip Bagus, Philip with two Ps at the end and B-A-G-U-S. Uh, he also teaches in Spain, an astonishing guy. Um, there's uh, the McCaffreys. There's... Um, uh, Carmen and um, and Matt McCaffrey, or Carmen Dorabot and Matt McCaffrey. They're a married couple. Two ma- two economists marrying. It's worked out so far. So, so, as long as you're from the same school, it works out. Um, they're producing tremendous material. Uh, per Beeland at uh, in Oklahoma is, is is teaching Austrian economics to students, and they absolutely love it. So I don't even mean Xavier Merat, who did his Ph.D. work on derivatives. And what would the Austrian school have to say about derivatives? Well, I mean, that's really, really important right now. And then, of course, we have older folks like like Guido Holzman, who's sort of been more of in my generation. But the, the trouble is now for the Mises Institute, when we do this week long seminar every year for college undergraduates called Mises University. Well, usually we have all the oldsters like Walter and me teaching. But we realize at some point. We got all these young whippersnapper PhDs. We got to show them off too. So it's actually going great, believe it or not, in academia. Even though academia is crazy and full of lunatics, there's room for us too in this wild uh, place. So there. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you very much, Tom. Jeff, most of us in the room know about the Mises Institute, but why does the Institute matter? And what do you hope to accomplish through the Institute? Well, I think the Institute matters because we need an end run around academia. If you look at our history, uh, when, when Rothbard was starting out with Rockwell, and Rockwell was talking to Martin von Mises, there was a, a distinct split in approach and strategy between what people thought of as a Hayekian top-down model with the goal of influencing intellectuals in society, especially journalists, academics, and that would sort of filter down into policy and into the greater society, and a bottom-up approach to trying to find intelligent lay people, like the people in this room, wherever you could, and and try to make inroads that way. And so our mission has always been to be an alternative school, to be a school that's mostly free, that anyone can go to and consume as much or as little education as they want. Maybe that just means reading an occasional article. Maybe that means diving in. Uh, but, but nonetheless, it, it's an end run around the academic gatekeepers. I think that's the single most important thing we can do. Look, no, nobody wants the West or the United States to go down in flames into some uh, terrible economic or, or uh, military catastrophe. And, no, you know, it, it, none of us want to be 
the person who stands on top of the Mad Max rubble and plants the flag and says, see, we were right. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's not what we want. But nonetheless, there are, there are academic gatekeepers. This is a real phenomenon. And so I would argue that if it weren't for the Mises Institute, uh, an awful lot of people wouldn't have heard of Mises and Rothbard and, and Austrian economics because they, they can't get it in college. They can't get it even as a Ph.D., uh, candidate at most universities. So I think that's uh, that's very, very important that we exist for lay audiences and unashamedly so. In other words, that's that's our mission is to be an alternative school for anybody who's interested and, and needs an alternative to be. Thank you very much, Jim. <laughs> Dr. Block, I think you've been a member of the Libertarian Party for quite some time, correct? And having studied under uh, Murray Rothbard, what do you think Murray would think of the modern day Libertarian Party? <laughs> well, I'm a professor. I'm never supposed to answer any question uh, directly. And, and also, when people ask me if they want, if I want vanilla or, or chocolate ice cream, my answer is both. So I'm going to answer the questions that those two guys answered also. And then I'll answer yours. Fair enough. Uh, with regard to Tom's question with young people, I want to mention four of my ex-students or former students of mine, Ed Stringham, teachers of Connecticut, yes. Andy Young at Texas Tech, Dan D'Amico and Emily Scarbeck, teach at Brown. I've got about six or eight other former students of mine who are now professors of economics and hopefully actually, not hopefully, but actually doing what I did for them, namely introducing them to Mises and Hayek and Rothbard and, and the Mises Institute. Uh, a lot of these people have been at the uh, Mises Institute as well. With regard to the question Jeff was asked, uh, what does the Mises Institute mean to you? Well, I can answer what it means to me because I've been there before him. <laughs> actually, uh, I take credit for him being there. Because it was once a time where we didn't have a, a clear executive director of, of the thing, and we had a little seminar of the senior fellows of the uh, Mises Institute, and we were going around and, you know, asking, well, who should be the next uh, leader of the Mises Institute? And my suggestion was, let's raid Ron Paul. <laughs> Whoever Ron Paul hired, it can't be all bad. <laughs> let's get him. And that's how we got uh, Jeff. So I take credit for that. But my recollection of that meeting is that I pushed for Jeff. <laughs> I, I, I never heard of Jeff. I, at that meeting, but I never heard of though, me. <laughs> <laughs> At that meeting, I never heard of Jeff. I just said, let's pick someone who works for Ron. OK, Paul. all right. Maybe I knew it was Jeff. All right. OK, okay. just want to just want to kiss up to Jeff as much as I can. <laughs> <laughs> Get online. <wine. laughs> the, uh, the second uh, point that I would make about the Mises Institute is that it is different than the Cato Institute or Reason or many of the other Beltway think tanks. Very, very different in the sense that it adheres to Rothbardianism, Misesianism. It adheres to uh, pure libertarianism and pure Austrianism, whereas these other groups with bumpers, uh, group uh, uh, an exception, uh, don't adhere as well to these, uh, to these uh, principles. Now for the question you asked me, which was? <laughs> What do you think Murray Rothbard, having studied under him, uh, think of the modern day Libertarian Party? Well, Murray was not. A, Murray started out as a big fan of the Libertarian Party, but then uh, there were uh, non-kosher elements of the Libertarian Party that Murray didn't much agree with. Uh, there were people who would try to water it down, and I, I don't think Murray wanted a Libertarian Party that watered it down to just you know get a few more votes. So Murray was ambivalent about it. On the one hand. He used to say uh, when I was part of the living room crowd, and by the way, the big problem with the living room crowd, stomach cramps, Murray was so funny, he'd have you in stitches for hour after hour. It was the most grotesque thing. Torture was wonderful. Uh, what Murray used to say is, look, every four years or every two years, the, the average guy who's interested in beer and bowling or maybe baseball or something like that focuses on uh, politics. And uh, why shouldn't we try to get our message out then, too? I ran for New York State Assembly in 1969, which was before the federal party started. The national party started, I think, 71, 72. Well, 72 uh, was uh, John Hosper, an old teacher of mine who ran for president. I think it started in 71, but the New York State Party was in 68, 69, and I ran for it then. And Murray was a big, big fan of the Libertarian Party initially. But then there were elements of the Libertarian Party that were not as... Um, 
principal as he would have liked it to be, so he was very disappointed. Oh, uh, please be. If you go back and read not only Rothbard but other people, you'll find there's been vicious infighting in the LP almost since day one. So nothing that's happening is new uh, or unprecedented. It's just we know more, again, because the social media allows everyone to sort of know everyone else's thoughts. So none, none of this is new. And the, the old adage is that you know, the smaller the movement, the more vicious the factions within. So that may be true. But, but also, um, you know, if you go, if you go back and, and look at this idea that there's always someone trying to water down or someone trying to be more pure. I mean, I, I think Rothbard was a big tech guy and, and viewed this as a multi-pronged approach. And so the idea of engaging in politics is just one one uh, mechanism for this multi-pronged approach and, and certainly not the only. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeff. How can we make freedom more attractive than free stuff and combat the rising popularity of people like AOC and Bernie Sanders? See, we were on the, we were, I thought we were on the reason versus me. <laughs> you want to go back, you want to go back to reason, Kato? No, I we don't. Can do that. That's okay. not like it was heading that way, which is <laughs> what you want. Um, yeah, free, I, I mean, here's the thing is, is you can't. You, that, that's the question. Is, is human nature such that it takes some sort of war or economic catastrophe to sort of wrench people out of their sleepwalking and, and bring them back to the reality that what the Fed's doing, what the military's doing, what Congress is doing, what it, the entitlement landscape, none of this is sustainable. Does it require a crash? Well, whatever that looks like. Or can human beings get together and sort of say, wait a minute, you know, the, we're, we're, you know, we're James Dean, we're in the, in the Porsche, we're going around the curve, but there's still time to put the brakes on and counter steer and, and not go over the cliff. Um, from, a, from an entitlement spending perspective, we're, we're past the point of no return on that cliff, by the way. So we're not, we're not coming back. There's no political or mathematical answer to entitlements down the road. That, that's a non-starter. So I think libertarians have to accept that and, and talk about how to move forward with that reality. This is not going to be solved in Washington, D.C. No way, no how. There's, there's zero political will for cutting entitlements. Less than zero. The, the population over 65 in this country is going to double in the next 30 years. Any national candidate, obviously a libertarian should, but I mean, the national candidate in the other two parties is, is never going to touch entitlements. They're not even going to do cost of living stuff. They're not even going to do means testing on that. You know, the, how much appetite there is for cutting military spending, it seems very limited to me. You see what they're doing to, a, to uh, uh, Tulsi for even bringing this stuff up. And I have to say, I've been pleasantly surprised with her to date, so the strength of some of her statements. But I think what they're going to do is they're going to put her out there as a sacred cow, um, let her get 1% or 2% in a couple of the early primaries, uh, get her with some gotcha set-up questions in some of the early debates, and then again, the Bill Crystals of the world will be able to say, oh, that non-interventionist foreign policy, see, we considered that, but nobody, you know, people overwhelmingly rejected it. So that's what they'll do to her. But, but entitlements and defense spending, there, there's no political answers to these problems. And there's nothing on the horizon in terms of a, a, a political sea change on those issues. So I think we, we start from that baseline. And I think you start saying, well, what can you do on the state and local level? States that are interested in maybe coming up with their own currencies, states that are interested in having a gold repository, whatever it might be. Um, I think forward thinking governors, for example, would be worrying about entitlements and debt and spending right now on the federal level. Uh, so I, I think the Libertarian Party has some green grass there to go after and say that we're the party that's going to talk about this stuff. Um, that's going to be anti-war and anti-Fed and anti-entitlements because that'll never be a 51% position perhaps in this country, but there's a lot of people out there who understand. So I would say, you know, go after with a full-throated approach. Yeah, absolutely, Matt. Can I add on to this? Absolutely. See, the problem with your format is you ask such great questions that I want to answer them all. Uh, the way I interpret that question is how can we be more attractive to non-libertarians? How can we better promote liberty? So I ask myself, who were the most successful people in promoting liberty in the past? And the answer is Ayn Rand and Ron Paul. Ayn Rand for my generation, Ron Paul for the younger generation. And what I get from that is that they were very different. I mean, I think that there's no third person, maybe Milton Friedman, but uh, those two were way above any other people in promoting libertarian ideas. And yet they were almost the very opposite in personality. 
Ron Paul was a sweetie pie. He was sort of cuddly and nice. And you call Ayn Rand nice, she'll smack you in the face. <laughs> and yet, you know, and also they promoted liberty in very different ways, one through novels and one through politics. So what I get from that is there's no one right way to promote liberty. We should all promote liberty in the way that we enjoy it the most. To go uh, make a movie, uh, be an economist like I am, uh, start a think tank uh, uh, like Jeff uh, with the uh, Mises Institute, uh, be the political party, be the, um, what do they call that, the Free State Project in um, New Hampshire. New Hampshire is another way to do it. Uh, go sing a song or, you know, sing a song about liberty, whatever it is, because we're supposed to have fun. And... So I wouldn't want to say, you know, you should do this, you should do that, and you should do this. Everyone should do something that they enjoy. And that'll be the best way to promote everybody. Thank you, Dr. Clark. Uh, Tom, are presidential candidates important to spreading the message of liberty, and have you completely ruled out a 2020 run? Oh, well, the second part of that is yes, of course I've ruled it out. But um, but, but the thing else, <laughs> but, but the second, well, but I mean, I, I do have my eye on a certain person. I don't think he wants me to mention his name, but he might be seated in this room at that table right there. But, but anyway, um, I'm, I'm of two minds on this because... I, I get that the Libertarian Party hears occasional people, myself included, saying it's hopeless to try to run in the presidential race and, and, and there are many logistical problems and, and, and we just can't get our voice out there. And shouldn't we just take all these resources and focus them on some winnable local races and build from there? But the answer to that has the practical answer to that has been the thing that generates interest, and excitement and funding for the party is the presidential race. So you you know you would you think oh okay we we abandon that and instead we focus on local things but then we lose all the we lose our mojo in a way we lose some of the energy. And so when I heard that response I thought okay well now I feel kind of dumb for my original recommendation you know because I think that's a legitimate answer. So the, I guess the answer would be it can be and it ought to be and that this is why it's so important this is why I said at the 2016 uh national convention that if we have an opportunity to, ha to at least get some ears listening to us, we can't sound like we're some retired politician who's got some ideas for sprucing up government. I mean, if that's the message we're sending, who's going to abandon the traditional two parties if they say, well, this party that probably isn't going to win has a slightly different approach where they're going to take the best from the other two. That was the message that I sometimes heard. We're going to take, because sometimes these people have good ideas and those people have good ideas. We're going to take the best from both. To that, I want these two parties, if, if, if you're unhappy about what you see, these two parties, one or another has been in charge as long as you've been alive. Okay? They are both to blame. If you keep voting for one of them, you're going to perpetuate the very things you hate. That's a fact. So we're different. We're not a little bit different from them, 12% different, or we want to tax you a different way from the way they want to tax you. I mean, I'm already falling asleep listening to that. And then also, the AOCs of the world, now it's different. Promoting socialism or democratic socialism and libertarianism, I'll grant you it's different because offering people free stuff doesn't require them to read Mises. They immediately say, a check with my name on it, sign me up. It's easier to get. I understand that. But no. Nobody was saying to AOC, listen, you better tone down your approach here and just tell people we just want to ratchet it up a little. She came right out and said, we want those tax rates on the rich to go up to 70 percent. And you know what? 90 percent sounds good, too. And everybody clapped. OK, it doesn't necessarily work that way for us. But doggone it, we got to at least try. You have to lift people out of their torpor and their apathy by saying something that differentiates you. And yes, you won't get the 70 million votes, but you'll get those 1 million activists. And that's your start. You need that base of those activists. And they don't respond. It's like the remnant. You know, Isaiah's job, Albert J. Knox's famous essay, where Albert J. Knox says, there's a remnant out there. You don't know who they are, or where they are. You don't know what their names are, but they respond to somebody who tells them the truth. And if you're going to pull those people in, if you think you're going to pull them in by saying what we need is good government and we need to get rid of corruption and we need we need a, a, a sales tax instead of a, they're going to tune you out. But if you say this whole propaganda regime of the welfare warfare state is killing us, 
and we got to do something radically different. And you just come around and you say, and I'm going to tell you truths that you're going to hate me for telling you, but I got to tell them to you. That's how you get those people out. We have to appeal to that remnant. Very, very much. Okay. I do think Hornberger Woods has a good ring to it, though. I'm not going to lie. I couldn't hear that. I one. said, I do think Hornberger Woods has a good ring to it. <laughs> yeah, Tiger Woods, maybe. <laughs> Dr. Block, not all Austrians are always on the same page. Surprising, I know. <laughs> what do you believe to be some of the most popular debates between Austrian scholar thinkers today? That's a very vicious, nasty question. <laughs> I think he should be arrested. <laughs> nice. Well, there are debates among Austrians. Uh, Bill Barnett and I have a uh, long paper, a 90-page paper, attacking the Austrian Triangle. The Austrian Triangle is something that um, uh, Hayek and Rothbard and pretty much everyone else used, including me. And in that paper, we had a long footnote about how whoever used the triangle was wrong. I was one of them. And I believe that, you know, if you make a mistake, you make a mistake. Mises never used the triangle. So we criticized the, uh, the Austrian Triangle. That would be one, one divisiveness. Then another one would be... I once gave a speech, I forget which group I gave it to, and they said that uh, a month before, some other Austrian gave a speech, and the title was Austrian Economics. I'm not going to mention the guy's name. I don't want to embarrass him. And uh, the people in the audience said, you know, it's as if night and day. You, know, you gave two different speeches. To me, the essence of Austrian economics is a thing called praxeology. And what is praxeology? Praxeology is the logic of, of human action, uh, the idea that we have, uh, we, we are empirical. We have some empirical stuff, like if the price of bananas goes up by 10%, we know that fewer bananas will be purchased, but we don't know how many fewer bananas will be purchased. Depends upon the elasticity of the demand curve, for those of you who have had Economics 101. But we also believe in economic law, that there are certain apodictic, necessarily non-deniable truths that uh, that we don't have to uh, use empirical knowledge for. For example, I bought this watch for 10 bucks. I necessarily, at the time I bought it, looked upon it as more than $10 value. Otherwise, I wouldn't have bought it. Namely, I made a profit ex ante. And the seller of the watch who sold it to me for $10 valued it at less than $10. He might have valued it at $9, and he made a dollar profit also ex ante. Ex post, you can re regret your, uh, your trades, but ex, uh, ex ante, necessarily trade is mutually beneficial. We don't have to test that. How could you test that? It's not falsifiable. We Austrians, or I shouldn't say we Austrians, but my group of Austrians, the Rothbardian, um, the Sessian Austrians, as opposed to the, the Goyesha Austrians, the, the, the bad guy Austrians, we believe in praxeology, namely that there are some apodictic necessarily, uh, necessary truths. When we don't have physics envy, we don't see that economics is only an empirical science. It's partially an empirical science, but not uh, totally an empirical science. There are also necessary truths. For example, the minimum wage law will raise uh, unemployment for unskilled workers higher than it otherwise would have been. It's not falsifiable because we don't know what otherwise would have been. And also, that there's a tendency for profits to equalize in all industries, assuming risk away. This is not falsifiable either, because a tendency, you, you can never say, well, the profits are different. Well, there's a tendency. This is why the mainstream looks upon us as, uh, us um, hardcore Austrians as uh, cultists. This is why Hayek couldn't get a job at the University of Chicago, because Friedman and Stigler blackballed him from the economics department. They think that we're uh, a cult or a religion or something like that, because there are some parts of economics, like the minimum wage law, like rent control, like free trade, and, and uh, 52,000 other things. Hans Hoppe is magnificent on this sort of a thing. Uh, which you don't, not only don't you have to, not only can't you test, but you need not test. You can illustrate it. We're not against econometric work. You can illustrate the minimum wage law, but it, you know, I have to tell you a story about my dissertation, uh, my PhD dissertation with Gary Becker, who won a Nobel Prize in economics. And my dissertation was the more rent control the lousier housing holding everything it can constant. And usually my independent variable rent control would get the right sign and would be statistically uh, significant. 
But every once in a while, it, it, I got the wrong sign, and every once in a while, the wrong sign was statistically significant. So you think Becker, who would be a, a neoclassical economist, would say, well, you know, I've got this genius here, a block, who's going to turn over everything we know about rent control. No, what he said is, he didn't say this, but he meant it. He said, block you, Warren, go out and do it again until you get it right. So what was testing what? Was my stupid econometric regression equations testing what we know about rent control, namely rent control that retards investment in housing and makes housing worse, other things equal? No, it was the very opposite. I, I just, what was testing what was the, 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 the apodictic truth about rent control was testing my, my theories. So in any way, to get back, there are Austrians, not associated with the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics, which is uh, associated with the Mises Institute, but there are other Austrian journals, and not the one in Spain or, or France either, but uh, in other places, where they're not praxeologists. So to me, this is a gigantic uh, debate within Austrian economics. One other uh, very brief. And here I agree with Murray, not Mises, on monopoly theory. I think um, Murray was much better in his chapter 12 of Manny Communist State on monopoly and antitrust. I think Mises was a little bit wrong here. So that would be yet another uh, division among Austrians on, on economics. Thank you very much, Dr. Bob. And final question of the day. Since you asked for it, Jeff. Some people are familiar with the Cato and Mises split or Rothbard oh, split. No. How can we do, how can we work to fix that divide? Oh, we can't. Is it possible? Is it possible? I forgot possible? the mic was on. <laughs> especially, in, especially, in the, especially in the Libertarian Party. I mean, first we have an ecumenism of <laughs> reaching out. Look, a lot of this is, you got to understand, it's, a lot of it is just inherent. A lot of it's old. A lot of it's personal, individuals, egos. That's part of human nature. I think you have to grapple with that in any kind of movement or organization. So it, it is what it is. I, I would say that... Um, for example, the Cato Institute is a big, big place. There's a lot of people there, so it, it's dangerous to characterize an organization based on one person or two people or five people. Um, and, you know, they do a lot of tremendous work. I think their foreign policy shop's gotten really yeah, a lot better great. in the last five years, better than it was in the early 2000s when W was B&W. And so, you know, these kind of things are, uh, to me, they're welcome. I, I don't want to... I don't want to have unanimity necessarily. I think having people challenge each other's ideas and thoughts. Um, we we have Cato people at our events. We have Cato people on our um, on, on our shows and that sort of thing. Uh, it was, you know, same goes for a reason. You know, and and what it really comes down to is, uh, do you, can you have differences of opinion without disparaging the motivation? I, I, I think that's the ultimate question. Sometimes you do that. Yeah, sometimes no. Apparently. But, uh, but but there you go. And, and um, you know, any time you look at any kind of little skirmish, especially online, just ask yourself if it's going to matter in two years or five years. Oftentimes the answer is no. Um, so that's how I approach it. All right, I know we're, we're over time. So let me just say a little just a little word about this. I think these I mean, these divisions have been there a long time. But during the Ron Paul campaigns, I think they were suppressed a bit. Because a lot of us were more willing to work together because it was such an exciting moment and we could overlook some of the other differences. And boy, did I meet people who are worlds apart from me and I made friendships that I cherish to this day. And I think the anti Ron Paul libertarians weren't so outspoken because they knew they were going to get their, you know, somebody's going to wring their neck because everybody was so pro Ron Paul. So they just kept quiet. Whereas now they feel like they can badmouth uh, a lot of our folks. So when, when in terms of the Cato thing, I mean, my, I, I'm, I think I'm much more open-minded about them than they are about me. As Jeff says, their foreign policy people are great. I've given them props on my show for that. I've had, uh, in the past at least, I've had Cato people. I've reached out to people who are beyond just my ordinary circle. When you've got to do five episodes a week for five and a half years, you've got to reach out to new people. You've even had me <laughs> That's right. But, <laughs> that's right. But, but here's the interesting thing. Um, I actually gave a talk at the Cato Institute about 12 years ago, or, and, and it was because I won a book award, and they had decided that whoever the book and article winners in this competition were, it, it, Cato was not sponsoring the competition, but, but they were going to have a one-day conference where all the winners would come speak. Well, they had no idea I was going to win, and they had already invited all the authors to come speak. So I went to give a talk, and they're hating every minute of it. 
And uh, not every minute of my talk, I gave a really pleasant talk. I, I wasn't going to show up there and denounce them like a, some kind of a jerk. I mean, I'm not like that. I gave a talk that everybody in that room agreed with and loved. But on the program, every single participant was listed main institutional affiliation. I was at the Mises Institute. So my name was on there. No institutional affiliation. Now, that's just childish. The Mises Institute has had Cato people on there. It would never even dawn on us. Not to list, I mean, how childish can you be? I just thought, that's just dumb. You know, that's, there's no room for that. So I don't go for, well, you know, who knows who's to blame, and there's blame enough on both sides. No, because we've never done that. And then finally, the last thing is, their official policy, and I know this from five, I have friends, Woods has friends everywhere, okay? <laughs> and they've told me that, that a certain person who is the executive vice president of that or institution has told them, <laughs> They are not to appear on my show, go on my cruise, or even retweet me. Or And so every once in a while, somebody at K, like some youngster who doesn't know the policy, will just lob an attack at me unprovoked. And I'll say, you're going to get a talking to tomorrow. And, and sure enough, the threat stops dead. I never hear from them again. That's crazy. That's crazy. So, so I like to respond the way I, I, I'm, I'm a funny guy. So my response is occasionally I'll tweet out an ad for the, for our cruise to that person. I'll say, we'd love to have you. And I know he can't, he, he can't acknowledge my existence. So he has to let it go, but it must be making him crazy. And little things like that warm my heart. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Everybody, please give a round of applause to these three awesome gentlemen for having this discussion with us. All right, gang, before we wrap up, before I tell you about the unbelievable guest on tomorrow's show, you absolutely cannot possibly miss tomorrow's episode. You're going to be thanking me for urging you to listen. I, I tell you that. But before we get to that, a couple quick things to tell you. I want to remind you that the New York City premiere of The Housing Bubble, a documentary I did with uh, Jimmy Morrison, that's taking place June 26th, and this is 2019, and we're going to have a great all-star panel to discuss the documentary and related issues immediately following the screening. And it's going to consist of Peter Schiff, Gene Epstein, David Tice, and Jim Grant. And it's it's just uh, just great. And I think we also have a, I'm not sure that it's totally confirmed, but we have a very, very good person we've also recruited to moderate that panel. That's going to be a great night out you're not going to want to miss. So get the details on that. Go to tomwoods.com slash NYC. Second, I have a couple of quick websites to tell you about created by listeners of the show. StephenRuel.com, which is Stephen with a P-H, R-E-U-E-L. It's the author site of his first novel, The Secret Pastor. And he says it was always a Christian novel, but as he became more libertarian, so did the novel. He says there aren't a lot of conservative Christian novels that drop the name Ludwig on Mises. So he says, I know you'll enjoy it. So check that out at StephenRuel.com, S T E P H E N. R-E-U-E-L dot com. And then secondly, mansionvoice.com. That is a basically a catalog of Christian and or libertarian titles that the creator admires, and particularly lesser known works by undervalued greats, put it that way. But he recently signed his first exclusive, and it's from a it's a book written by a Tom Wood Show listener, George McGilligan. And it's called A Christian's View on Government. And from the blurb, we read, In this piercing, insightful essay, George McGilligan reviews the predatory nature, fundamental deceit, and consequential immorality of governments as we have known them throughout man's history. So find out more about that at mansionvoice.com. All right, who's coming up tomorrow? Well, this one I just thought, I'm not exactly sure where this conversation is going to go, but it's got to be a good one. And that's Louis J. Gomez. Now, a lot of you folks are going to know who that is. He is the guy who created the Gas Digital Network, which features Dave Smith's podcast, Michael Malice's program, and many, many others. He is firmly committed to free speech. He's a comedian. Now, he's a comedian who's pretty, you know, he's not PG, let's say. So be prepared if you listen to Louis J. Gomez comedy. And he he's part with Dave and Big J. Okerson. He is a part of the Legion of Skanks, which let's just say in tone and content is rather different from the Tom Wood Show. So your worlds are going to be colliding tomorrow. But what an interesting story Louis J. Gomez has to tell. It's going to be absolutely fantastic. Can't possibly miss that. So uh, make sure you're not just listening, you know, in an isolated fashion here and there. Got to subscribe on iTunes or so-called 
Apple Podcasts at tomwoods.com slash iTunes, and I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.